You may have recently seen this video of a Gulfstream going off the end of the runway that was filmed by a comedian that goes by Fluffy. Everyone that went off the end of the runway was fine, but that guy recently did an interview with this woman. You probably know her as Amy Farrah Fowler from The Big Bang Theory. This comedian, Fluffy, his real name is Gabriel, he did some interviews on this plane incident, crash, accident, whatever you want to call it that he was in, and you normally don't get to have a first-hand account from somebody that was in any type of an accident like this. So it's really interesting to see what he says and see what he perceived, everything going on, and, and what happened with all the information I was able to gather off the internet. Check this out. You experienced something which, indeed, was extremely unusual, right? Did your life flash before your eyes just for a moment? It did. It did. Uh, I was very shaky right out. As soon as the plane stopped, I was just like, you know, so, I, I felt like I was about to have a panic so there attack was, for sure. Well, so there's like two things that happened in that there was I I in intense, insane turbulence. Yes. So, we, so talk, talk about kind of what that was. Well, we we flew. It was a it was a very short flight. It was only supposed to be like a little under an hour mm -hmm. flying from Alabama to North Carolina. OK. And as soon as we left the ground, you know, it was. The weather was a thing. Uh huh. Uh, we get what into was a, the weather? It, it was raining. Oh, okay. It was, it, was, it, was, it was raining. Okay. Uh, but we went into a really dark gray cloud. Oh. And as soon as we hit that cloud, the it was like, you know, the whole plane just, you know, you got the regular turbulence yeah. that we're used to. And then it, this one, um, it dropped. Oh, no. And so <laughs> I left my seat because I didn't wear a seatbelt because eh, it's a private flight. Right. Nobody there to yell at me and tell me to put on a seatbelt. So I basically went up and, and I, wow. hit, I hit the, you know, the you ceiling. And my dogs were on dog beds and you just see the dog beds. No. no. Yeah. While you're boarding a plane and before takeoff, usually there's going to be two different sets of announcements. One from your flight attendant there telling you how to use your seatbelt and to wear your seatbelt. And then a lot of times pilots make the same announcement. It goes something like, uh, from the flight deck, make sure all of you, while you're seated in your seat, keep your seatbelt securely fastened in case we experience any unexpected turbulence. We say that for this exact reason. So I basically went up and, and I, wow. hit, I hit the, you know, the I, ceiling and my dogs were on dog beds and you just see the dog beds. No. no. Yeah. In the thousands of hours of time that I've spent on a plane, I've never seen a pilot ever take off or usually ever be in that seat without their seat belt securely fastened. Now, there has been one case that I can think of where they didn't have their shoulder harnesses on takeoff, but that's pretty much the only time I've ever seen that. And typically speaking, the pilots, unless we're about to get up to go get food or go to the bathroom, things like that, we have our seat belts fastened for this exact reason. So we don't float up and hit the panel. The panel above our seats usually has a lot of buttons and some of them hurt. I've known that because I walked into them as I was trying to get in my seat. Now, Gabriel being a passenger, he's not going to see this cloud in front of him like we will as a pilot. So he wouldn't know to put on his seat belt right before this happened. Okay. Uh, but we went into a really dark gray cloud. Now, typically, if we're in cruise and we see something that we're not going to be able to go around or we know that there's going to be some bumps, then we'll turn the seatbelt sign on if we already have turned it off or we'll make an announcement. But usually right after takeoff, the seatbelt sign is on. So you're expecting everybody to be in their seats. And so you're expecting them to be wearing their seatbelt. Who would not be wearing their seatbelt on takeoff from a plane? And a lot of times when the planes pull onto the runway and there's a lot of thunderstorms in the area, we'll actually sit there for a second and let our radar do a full sweep so we know exactly what direction we want to take off in and we can tell that to air traffic control. We typically are trying to avoid these very dark clouds that he has flown into because a lot of times they contain a lot of mass. And if it has a lot of mass, particularly water, you can get a lot of updrafts and downdrafts. And it sounds like that's what happened. You know, you got the regular turbulence yeah. that we're used to. And then it, this one, um, it dropped. The reason that's happening is because in these big rain clouds that dump a lot of rain, they're sucking a lot of air up so you can get in there and actually start getting pushed into your seat. And if you're in the back as a passenger, you may not know, is that the pilot actually going up or is that the wind that's getting sucked up into that cloud that's actually pushing the plane up because the sensation to you as a passenger feels about the same. Now, as a pilot, you know exactly what you're doing. Are you intending to climb? And if you're not, you're getting pushed into your seat, you know, oh, well, we might be hitting the other side of that, which could be a downdraft. Now, you can simulate this loss of gravity sensation. Sometimes you'll see pilots do it in very small planes where they just get 
everything floating in the air. But typically commercial pilots or people like this that are flying in private jets, that's not what we're trying to do. We're usually trying to make it as smooth of a ride as possible. And going into a very dark cloud, typically you're not gonna do unless your radar is showing that there's not any moisture that's in that cloud because your radar is picking up the moisture that's in these clouds. So it's possible that would just happen to be a dark cloud without a lot of moisture. I don't know, I wasn't there, but it is possible. And I've gone into clouds before where all of a sudden everything gets really dark and I think, uh-oh, this is gonna suck. But some typically I, I haven't had this situation like he's talking about where everything goes floating. Now, I spent a lot of time flying in weather where there's a lot of thunderstorms. So maybe that I just have more experience getting around very bad weather because I have a lot of experience doing that flying small turboprops and things like that where you can't go above it like I can now. Uh, in this flight, they weren't flying at a very high elevation because they were going a very short distance. So it could be that there wasn't anything painting on the radar. I don't know, I wasn't there. Listen what he says next. What came to you in that moment? Uh, well, as soon as I hit and I came back down to my seat, first thing I did was I grabbed my phone mm. because I wanted to record and, and, and document whatever, Whoa. you know, mm. this, is, this could be it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And as soon as I hit record, the plane levels out. <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> Nothing? Mm. <laughs> That sounds exactly like what I was talking about. He got into a cell. In that cell, the air was very turbulent because the air is moving around for the updrafts and downdrafts, and that creates a lot of turbulence, and then it's short-lived. And a lot of times what you'll see is there's a line of clouds, and you need to get through that thunderstorm, and it's in a line, and it, you're not typically gonna be flying along the middle of that line. You're gonna try to cut a hole and find a gap to split that line. Again, in South Texas or in South Florida or all of Florida, in the summertime, that's all you're doing. You're spending your, your entire day is picking through these types of clouds. So you get good when you're doing that a lot of being able to read the clouds and figure out, okay, that one's growing or that one's falling. So I, let's go through that one. It, it, it kind of is a skill that just comes with experience. I don't know what these guys saw, but it could have been, hey, that looked like the best gap to get through. Let's try to hit that. And it sounds like it was a very short couple seconds but if you're scared of flying, a couple seconds feels like an hour. Now, this is the part where he talks about the landing. But then when, we're, when we came in for the landing... Right, so then this is the second thing yeah, that so happens. The, so when we came in for the landing, usually, you know, you'll, you'll hear and feel mm -hmm. the plane's engines. Right. And then you kind of come in and it starts to glide. Yeah. And then you touch down and then the reverse thrusters kick in. And then you feel yourself slow yeah, down. There was no EU. The, there was no EU. <laughs> And the thrusters did not turn on. And so we just kept going at the same speed. No. There was no slowing down. We touched and kept going. And it was weird because I could actually see when we came in, we came in a little bit of an angle. And they told me that it's common for planes to come in a little bit of an angle and at the last second it turns uh -huh. and, and straightens out. But I could see the runway and, you know, through my window. Yeah. And it's like I'm looking at it like this. You know what I mean? But I should be. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I can see it from the window, yeah, but yeah, I'm yeah. facing this way. That's the like, wrong angle. That's the wrong angle. And uh, yeah, it just started, you know, it kept going. It kept going. And then you just see grass and dirt hitting the windows. There's no official investigation that I found online. And of course, I spent about two minutes looking at that because really what I wanted to do was see his reaction and what he saw as this whole thing took place because like I said you don't normally get to talk to someone or see someone who does an interview about having a scary incident like this on a plane and something that happens in high stress environments as they say you tend to misremember or you can misremember things if you're not trained in everything that's going on. So the first thing that he said that was very interesting to me was he said that they were coming in at an angle where he was able to look at the runway. But I could see the runway and you know through my window yeah. and it's like i'm looking at it like this in order for that to be happening there's only a few situations that i can think of and the first one being if they were coming in with a very stiff crosswind and it's a crab a crab is where the pilots are keeping their nose directly facing the wind but the plane is actually tracking right down the middle of the runway so if you were sitting let's say on the right side of the plane and there was a really strong crosswind that was coming from this left hand side your plane would be going like this down the runway and you'd be looking out your window right down the runway, even though the nose of the plane is going that way. That's a crab. It's normal, but it is uncomfortable, especially if it's not something that you have experienced a lot of times. And most people don't see that 
often, something that we do in flight school all the time. Every plane is different to give the amount of crab that he's talking about where he's looking down the runway, but at a minimum, you're looking at about 25 knots of a direct crosswind, and that's gonna give the plane some rotation so you'd be able to see. Now here's the second scenario. He's looking out the window and sees another runway. This is a photo that I posted on Instagram a while back, joking about this being a really strong crosswind landing. And in some cases, from the pilot's perspective, that was on the flight deck and I wasn't working on that flight, but when you're sitting up there, that can be what it looks like as you're coming in with a really strong crosswind. But this picture was actually in Miami. The plane I was on was landing on runway 12, and this is a picture of runway 8. So I actually took the picture here right as we're about to land on runway 12, but it looks like we're on a really steep crosswind landing on the runway 8. If you're a nervous flyer and you're coming into land and you see the runway over there, you're thinking these pilots don't know what they're doing and they're about to land on the grass. So that's the second scenario I thought was possible. And the third scenario, which is very unlikely, would be they're doing a side slip. That's where the pilots purposely turn the plane on its side to lose altitude without gaining airspeed. The first time I did this, I probably had maybe 10 or 15 flight hours and my flight instructor explained to me, okay, let's say we're here, we're really high, we need to get down. Now, when you go down, the plane speeds up. If you need to lose that altitude really quickly, you can do a side slip. I said, okay, cool, side slip. And then he did it and it was very uncomfortable because you're not used to being in your plane tilted like this, facing the ground, it felt very, very strange to me. I actually was going to do that in that video with Stella. I said, hey, do you want to do something that's going to be very uncomfortable? She said no, so I didn't do it, and that's probably why we're still friends. But doing a side slip is the way that you can lose altitude really quickly without picking up speed, and that means the people in the back are going to be able to see out the window and see the runway because now you're sideways looking out towards the runway for the plane to lose altitude quickly without gaining a lot of speed but you don't normally ever see that on a commercial aircraft like this. The reason you won't see it on something like a G4 is because it's a swept wing. Look at the similarity of a 747 wing and a Gulfstream wing, and most commercial aircraft, they'll have this swept back wing compared to a Cessna like this. It's a different wing design, and I'm not gonna get into all the specifics, but the engineers designed this, and that is the better wing to have on the type of flying on it, let's say a 747 or a Gulfstream 4. That is the type of flying that, or type of wing that you wanna have when you're doing that type of flying compared to a Cessna. Now, the reason that you don't normally see commercial planes doing that is because there is a risk on a swept back wing like that, that one of the wings can lose lift. Now, if you're low to the ground trying to get low to a runway and your wing loses lift, you go from the problem of being too high to crashing into the ground. So the risk reward is just not there. On a small Cessna plane, not a big deal. The planes can handle that, but you typically won't see a commercial jet do that. There have been instances of them having to do that in an extreme emergency and it working out, but again, the risk reward is just not there, and so you'll probably never experience that unless you go into a small plane and ask the person to do a side slip. So we have three possible scenarios here. We have a very strong crosswind, we have an extra runway, or we have the side slip. Now, I was really curious, and like I said, there was no information that I could find online, but it shows they landed on runway 8 which initially was a bit strange to me because you can see here that would give them a tailwind as they were landing on this runway. Now typically planes like to land with the wind at their nose that helps us fly slower over the ground and stop in a shorter distance and that's typically why we do that. But landing with a seven knot or probably less because it's not a directly tailwind, but landing with a seven knot tailwind, not a big deal. Typical rule of thumb, 10 knots. Pretty much any plane can land with 10 knots. It's not a big deal but you are gonna be going faster over the ground. But with the wind at the tail like this, it rules out the number one theory. So there definitely wasn't a strong enough crosswind for them to be looking out the window like that, so that doesn't really make any sense. So I thought, all right, let's see about the extra runway. This is the chart of the airport, and there's only one runway. So that leaves the side slip. And so I got on the internet and I got this breakdown of the decrease in altitude as they were coming down. For some reason, I could only get it to come out in meters. I don't really know how to work this internet thing, but, Here's what I found. 
Based on this column here, it looks like they're on a pretty normal descent path through 1500 feet. And of course, then I was wondering, why would they land on a wet runway that short with a tailwind? That doesn't make any sense, so I looked up the approach plates. And there's only one approach to this entire airport, and it's for landing on runway 8. One of the things that pilots have to do when the weather's bad and there's low visibility or low clouds is that we have to be able to get down from the elevation or altitude that we're at to low enough to be able to see the airport and land. We're not going to just do it on our own. So as they come through the clouds, we fly these uh, procedures that give us different altitudes to meet as we go down to safely keep us away from mountains or anything else that's up there and those are called approaches. You can see on this weather report here, there's three different layers of clouds, there's four miles of visibility, and there's some rain, so it could be getting worse. This was the smartest choice to use to get below the clouds. And as I was looking at this approach to see, is there anything weird on this approach that would cause them to do this, I noticed something pretty interesting. With this being the only approach, you'll notice there's two things on this approach that are different than normal. One is the track to the airport is not directly lined up with the runway. Now that's not really common, but it does happen from time to time. And you basically, at a certain point, when you're able to make out the runway, you just break off and turn and land on the runway. It's something that we do at a lot of different airports. JFK, for example, has some, one of the approaches that it's kind of like that. So it's not dangerous, it's just not normal. But this being the case, that means the pilots would be coming here at an angle, roughly 14 degrees off from the runway, and if somebody were to be sitting on the right-hand side of the plane as they come in and turn, they would be looking down and probably seeing the runway. The other thing that's really important to notice here is right here. Look at this 3.5 degree descent path. Now, 99% of the time, it's a 3 degree glide as you come into the runway. 99% of the time. 3.5, not a major difference, but there is a difference. You're going to be going downhill a little bit faster. There are places where it's four or five degrees, not a big deal. I'm just saying these are things that are different than normal. You don't normally come in at an angle. You don't normally descend at three and a half degrees, which means your plane and your power settings have to change or you're gonna be going too fast as you get on the runway. So you could be possibly going a little bit faster than you wanna be going because you're going downhill faster and you're making a bank relatively low to the ground in order to get lined up with the runway after you complete this approach. So there's a lot of different abnormalities that are happening here that are coming onto this runway. You're doing a bank as you're low to the ground because you're not lined up with the runway. You're landing at an airport that has a short runway, 5,500 feet. You have a tailwind, it's wet, and you're descending at a faster rate than you normally are. Those are all different than you would normally have on your average day. And keep in mind, this 5,500 foot long runway, you'll notice this little thing right here. That indicates this tiny portion of the runway is unusable for landing. Now that's just a tip, and we all know that the tip doesn't count, but they're coming in faster than normal would be my guess, and the reason I'm saying that is because he said this. So when we came for the landing, usually, you know, you'll, you'll hear and feel mm -hmm. the plane's engines. Right. And then you kind of come in and it starts to glide yeah. and then you touch down and then the reverse thrusters kick in and then you feel yourself slow yeah, down. There was, no the, there was no EU. There was no EU. The other thing that really caught my attention is he said once they were on the ground, he didn't feel the brakes grabbing and he didn't hear the thrust reversers coming out. And once your wheels are on the ground, especially on a short runway, you have to do those things immediately. On my plane and a lot of commercial jets, we have this knob here, which is an auto brake setting. The Gulfstream doesn't have this, or the older, this particular Gulfstream and the older Gulfstreams don't have this, but basically what that does is that when you land, as soon as your tires speed up, this braking system is going to help your plane slow down in a smooth way. And what it's going to do is give like a landing distance. You're going to say, hey, the runway is this long. And so we need to stop in this amount of time. And so we're going to set this auto brake setting. And that's going to have a stop safely before the end of the runway. That's how we use it. Now, not having that is not a big deal. I've flown planes like this. This is just a 70 seater jet and they don't have auto brakes. That's why sometimes the braking could be a bit jerkier than if you're flying on a larger plane. There's nothing unsafe about not having auto brakes. It's just something different than what you're gonna experience if you're on a commercial plane. As soon as your tires touch down on a commercial plane, you'll sometimes feel that little bit of a jerk. That's the auto brakes picking up and grabbing. Now, the Gulfstream reversers do have something a little bit different than your commercial jet. 
and these are called buckets. I called a friend of mine while I was watching this to ask him how those work and are they good? Are they just as good as what we have on a commercial plane? And he goes, yeah, they're actually great. They're amazing. So typically what he said, what we do is we use our buckets. We don't even use the brakes just to make the landing pretty smooth. We'll use those buckets and those buckets will help the plane slow down in a really controlled fashion, kind of like a combination of what you experience on a normal commercial plane with the auto brakes and the thrust reversers. Just a combo of that. They use the buckets and apparently those work really, really well when you use them. Remember, they're landing on a 5,500 foot runway, minus the tip of course, and that isn't a lot of landing distance. And all the other factors, the wet, the tailwind, possibly going faster, possibly floating. What happens when you're trying to make a smooth landing, sometimes what you do is you float and you wanna just have that plane just grease onto the runway. The problem is, is when you're looking at this approach plate and you're seeing, okay, we got wet, we're gonna have a tailwind, we're gonna have a steeper descent, we're gonna be at an angle, we're on a very short runway, they may or may not have been familiar with that runway, but all of those things are adding up as risks. And one of the things that you do as a pilot is you're looking at how do we mitigate these risks? And so you would take an airport like this and you'd say, okay, we're not gonna make this a soft landing. We're just going to make this a firm landing, get down at the very start of the runway, and that is gonna be it. Because as a pilot, something you never wanna have your passengers experience is this. It kept going and then you just see grass and dirt hitting the windows. This airport, if I was flying, would not be the airport that I'm thinking, this is gonna be a smooth touchdown where everybody's gonna say, hey, you really greased it on. That's not what I'm going for. I'm going for firm landing and stopping before we get to the end of the runway. And there have been times at airports that I've gone to where it's a very short runway and that's my intention. I just say, hey, I'm, I'm gonna put this thing on firm, not slam it down there, but firm. So that way we dissipate the energy early and we don't have any risk. Nobody's gonna remember you if you're the guy that had that firm landing on that short runway with the tailwind and the wet conditions. Nobody's gonna remember that. That's never gonna be talked about. The passengers might say, oh, that was a hard landing. They may say that, but doesn't really matter. Not a big deal. They do remember when you take your golf stream off-roading. That's not something you ever wanna do. All right, here's some other things that he said. Go. So was this unrelated to the turbulent event or we don't know? I don't know if whatever happened in the sky. Because either one of those things is shitty well, and they both happen. We, you know, I, I'm not a pilot or, right. you know, I'm not an expert or anything, yeah, yeah. but I, I I don't know. I think maybe whatever happened up there. I see. Messed with whatever had to happen whatever down happened there. on the ground. Yeah. And uh, that's why we went and we ended up in a field. Gabriel, on the off chance that you ever make it this far into this video, which is seeming to be maybe one of the longest videos I've made in a long time, the turbulence that you're going to experience in flight should play no part in what's going on with the landing. So if you are, and I heard you're back flying again, which is awesome, but if you are flying and you do experience a lot of rough turbulence, even the part about going up in the air, that should play no impact in what goes on with the landing unless something breaks on the plane. And you would know that. So the two aren't correlated other than you being uncomfortable for the whole flight. The two aren't really correlated at all. And uh, as soon as I saw dirt and grass and then I looked to the window and I'm like, wow, we are in a, you could see cows. Mm -hmm. We are in a field. I think if we would have landed anywhere else in a major city, yeah, it, we would have ended up in the street for sure. Right. So he has a valid point. If that were to happen in a bigger city, you're at risk of hurting the people that are right outside the airport plus the plane that you're in. The difference is, is that in a lot of airports that are, have a lot of traffic going through them that are in very densely populated areas like Midway in Chicago, you're going to have something which is like a quicksand which will stop your plane before it goes off the end of the runway or outside of the boundaries of the airport because that has happened before. So this is a chart for Midway. I used to fly in here all the time at the regionals. And this is one of those airports where I would say, this is gonna be a firm landing, I'm not trying to make it soft. Because as you can see, these are short runways, and this here would be a displaced threshold, meaning you cannot land on this part of the runway. You can only land from this point going forward. And that's a lot more than just the tip. And you'll take, I'm flying, let's say a 70 seater regional jet that's in there, but Southwest flies a 737 in there, which takes a lot more people. And so they're having to be very precise of where they land that plane. And that's why if you ever fly in the midway, it feels like a very firm landing and they stop really fast. 
they're not doing anything wrong. They're doing the right thing by making that landing firm and stopping quickly. And that's why sometimes you'll hear me talk about Southwest pilots being some of the best as far as really hitting where they need to land. They're some of the best when it comes to that because they go into places like Midway all the time and they're having to land on that spot because if they don't, then they're gonna put their plane in the EMAS. EMAS is Engineered Materials Arresting System. And it looks like this and it will take a plane that's moving quickly into a complete stop really fast. Putting that EMAS in every airport is not very realistic. They have it in Midway because the risks of a plane going off the airport and off the runway, which happened a long time ago, but then you have people outside that wall driving in cars or walking along the street that are at danger. If you're at the Gulfstream airport where the plane went off the end of the runway there, you have some cows that could be hanging out and mud and grass. So the risk isn't as high and anything aviation related is crazy expensive. So to put that at every airport isn't very realistic. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.